Again, thank you to Mark. Thank you to the DockerCon organizers. Thank you to my team who is here. Some of them are sitting in front. Um, I might be the one on stage, but certainly everything that I'm going to talk about during this talk is the result of a group effort, and I'm really proud of the way that we all work together. So thank you so much. And I have some former coworkers here as well, so I'm feeling the love. Um, my name is Laura. Again, I'm a senior engineer at CodeShip, and for the next 45 minutes, prepare to have your minds blown. We're going to talk about parallel testing with Docker. So at CodeShip, and if you're not familiar with us, um, we're a CI and CD company. We focus on automating your tests and your deployment so that you can spend more time focusing on writing code and less time worrying about um, messing with servers in production. Uh, aside from that, I'm a Docker captain, and you may have heard some Docker captain chatter, or maybe even met some mysterious creatures called Docker captains. So we are meant to be kind of representation of the Docker community. Lots of us have been working with Docker for a very, very long time. If you are a newbie to Docker, we would love to talk to you. Any questions that you have, no question is too simple. Um, so please find us. A lot of us are wearing um, black hoodies that have little Docker seagulls on them. That's the captain marker. So feel free to say hi to us. Before I was at CodeShip, I worked for a really small research and development company, uh, or research and development team as part of CenturyLink, which some of you might know is a big telco provider. Um, they wanted to have some senior engineers working on really cool projects, and it just so happened that Docker was part of that. Um, so I worked on Panamax and Image Layers, which are two Docker tools that you maybe have, um, maybe have heard of if you were into Docker kind of before it blew up in, in big ways. And before that, I was at HP Helion on the infrastructure engineering team. So I have a lot of experience with uh, virtualization, and then more specifically in the, the last two years with Docker. And that's a bit of context for what I'm going to talk to you about today, which is parallel testing and how we can make it better with Docker. And we'll talk about the goals and the benefits of parallel testing, why we want it in the first place. We'll look at an implementation with LXC alone, so before Docker. And then finally, we'll see what it looks like and what it feels like as an engineer um, and as a consumer of the platform when we introduce Docker and tools from the Docker ecosystem into the platform. So let's get started um, simply by thinking about what it is we want to build in the first place. And throughout this talk, what I'm going to focus on, this um, mysterious platform that I'll talk about, is um, a customizable, very flexible build environment that can help us run tests in parallel. So that's the goal of what I'm going to be trying to build. And we'll talk about the different ways that we can build this platform um, using Docker and using LXC. So we want to be able to have full control over our testing environment and then be able to run tests quickly in parallel. And why do we want to do this? There's a couple reasons. Um, the most, probably, the most immediate one that comes to mind is that you just don't want to spend so much time waiting for your builds to build. You want to be able to um, not only deploy your code to production fastest so that you have your best code in front of your customers immediately, as soon as it's possible. Um, and on the other side of that, if something does go wrong, you want to be alerted of that sooner so that you can correct your course, fix the mistake, and then get moving and not have to worry about um, shipping bad code to production or waiting really long for your feedback cycles. If you still don't think automated testing or software testing in general is worth your time, um, this talk may not be for you. And please come and see me like after class in the code chip booth, and we can talk about <laughs> like testing in general. Not as an employee of a CI CD company, but just like as a software professional. I would love to talk to you about why you think testing is, is not important. Um, that wasn't a threat. I promise I'm very friendly. <laughs> so, um, so we want to have really short feedback cycles. Um, and on the other side, we want to be able to have full autonomy over every single thing that's going to run during our automated testing steps. So this means um, when the tasks are run, what services are run, how the dependencies are managed, everything that you could possibly imagine related to automated testing steps, I want absolute full control. And if we think about the why and, and then what Solomon said this morning about eliminating the friction in the development cycle, that's really what we're trying to do here. So parallel testing is just one way that we can eliminate friction in the development cycle and kind of make everything just work so that you don't have to worry about it. And we'll take this um, idea of a parallel testing platform, and there's a couple different places that you might use it. So as I mentioned, CodeShip is a hosted solution. Um, you can maybe have your own CI, CD solution. Those are places you could use a parallel testing platform. You can certainly also use it locally, and I'll demo using it locally as well. So I like to always run my tests before I push anything to even a feature branch. 
Um, some of my colleagues or some people I've worked with in the past prefer to rely on CI, CD to run builds for them. Just doesn't matter, whatever you prefer, um, as long as you're running tests. So when I run my tests locally before pushing things up, I want them to run really, really fast. Parallel testing can help that happen. But how can we get to this point? Um, this is a, a really challenging question and something that CodeShip has been working on for quite a few years. And if you look at testing tasks kind of as autonomous things, there's only so much you can do per task to really optimize them. So you might um, kind of change the way you use timeouts in integration tests. There's a couple other things. You can have a bigger build machine, for example. Um, but if you really want great optimization, you have to stop thinking about just optimizing the tests themselves, but optimizing the platform that you run the tests on. So what we're aiming for is something that looks a little bit like this. We want to be writing code, push it to a repository, GitHub or Bitbucket, and then be able to run a bunch of tasks in parallel that once those pass, can kick off a deployment. So this is a very simple um, kind of distilled example of what the platform is going to provide for us. And the way that we are going to do this is by using something called task parallelism. And if you've studied CS, you probably know all about parallelism. Um, task parallelism is running tasks across multiple processors in parallel environments. So this is different than taking a big data set and running parallel computations. Um, that's parallelism as well, but task parallelism is kind of a flavor of that. And the way we'll achieve this is by using a distributed system. So in this case, our, our multi-processor computer is really just a series of machines that are Docker hosts. And our processor is a container. So think of a container as just something that's going to run a process for us, and that's how we're going to enable ourselves to use um, this idea of task parallelism with Docker. And this brings us to an important point, because I think um, when a lot of us are starting out with Docker, and certainly I've given this definition and received this definition before, that Docker um, containers are just VMs. And you might, that might be a really good um, explanation of Docker for like your parents or your kayaking tour guide or someone that's non-technical and you're trying to explain what it is that you do all day because they don't understand it. Um, but if we keep thinking about this, we can't really solve very complex problems in unique ways until we kind of go, do away with this container VM mapping and start thinking about a container as just something that can run a process for us. Um, so as you can see with this task parallelism example, the only way that we can even implement this is if we change our thinking to think of containers as virtu uh, not virtual machines, but rather processes that can just accomplish some amount of work for us. But you might think, well, do we really need containers for this at all? Um, why not just use VMs? It seems like the system can be implemented pretty easily just with virtual machines. Um, so that's true, and, and we probably could do it. But there were a couple other concerns that prevented us from doing that. And uh, a main one was isolating the running builds on infrastructure. So CodeShip, of course, we have customers that run builds on our infrastructure. You might have multiple development teams within your organization that are running builds on the same infrastructure, and you really want to keep things separate because dependency management is a challenge and has been a challenge for a long time, um, hopefully up until the point you started using Docker. It's also really hard to impose resource limits um, just with VMs alone. And the most important thing, and, and maybe the sticking point for a lot of us, is that if you're using VMs, your infrastructure is really underutilized. Um, some people talk a lot about virtualization density, so the amount of um, kind of services that you can run per unit of virtualization. And with VMs, you have a, kind of a one-to-one -one mapping, so you need one VM for one service. That's not ideal. We want multiple services running on one VM. Um, so it seems like, Duh, containers are a great, great use case, or a great solution for this use case. So containers promise to help us impose resource limits, increase virtualization density, which is great, saves us money, saves our customers money, saves you money if you're uh, using this in, in a local system. You can run isolated code so that you don't have to worry about things kind of spaghettiing together. Dependency management is much easier. And you can really count on consistency across build runs, so not just a single development team running builds and having a reproducible, consistent environment, but many developers running many builds on many machines, they're all going to be the same. And using containers will help us implement this parallel task platform or parallel task design that I talked about earlier that's going to help us run tests much faster and have a much performant CI and CD automation system. 
So CodeShip set out to do this, and you can do it yourself with LXC, and that's what we did. And if you're a CodeShip customer, you might not know, um, or if you're familiar with CodeShip in the past, that CodeShip has been using containers since the very beginning of the company. Um, and that might be confusing or alarming or surprising in a good way to some of you because CodeShip, of course, existed before Docker did. And how we arrived to use LXC might be um, a bit better understood if we think about what was happening at the time when we started building the system and designing the system. So 2011 was the year that CodeShip was founded. Um, it was also the year that we found photographic evidence of salty water, flowing salty water on Mars, which was also exciting, um, maybe more important than CodeShip being founded, depending on who you ask. Um, it was also the International Year of Forests. I had a really fun time on Wikipedia for this slide. Um, <laughs> I don't know like how many countries need to participate in something for it to be international, so I don't know if it was like just Canada and something else, um, but it was the International Year of Forests. And maybe most importantly and most relevant to what we're talking about today, um, so Precise was released in early 2012, and in the months leading up to the release of Precise, there was a lot of talk and preparation done um, because the promise of Precise was easier LXC management. So if you look back in message boards and blog posts, uh, email chains, et cetera, starting maybe around July or August, you'll see a lot of chatter in sort of the de developer conscious about LXC, using LXC the different ways that LXC can solve problems um, opposed to traditional VMs. Um, also, the Green Bay Packers in the very early part of 2011 won the Super Bowl. And um, I think that was probably the most important thing to happen in, in 2011. And if we think about all of these things together, uh, maybe you could draw a conclusion about why CodeShip started to use containers, uh, LXC specifically. And we'll just, hold on, I'm gonna take a drink of water while you look at Aaron Rodgers. Yeah. Oh no, 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 get out. <laughs> um, so it probably didn't happen that Aaron Rodgers was like, hey, guys, why don't you use LXC? Um, but we did. We made the choice because it seemed like the logical thing for us to do. And Checkbot is our classic infrastructure, so this is what we built using LXC. It is still running in production, and it's really, really great and really powerful if you want a really low friction, easy to ramp up CI CD solution that you can kind of get with like just a couple clicks. Um, it just sort of does its work, sets you up, and gets out of the way. And um, the reason that it's so uh, easy to use is that we had to compromise a little bit of flexibility. Uh, so you don't have as fine-grained control as you might have um, when we talk about our Docker system, but it's incredibly easy to use. So this was a really, really good product for a lot of customers, and it's still used very heavily today. So we have a, a kind of peak of around 40,000 builds per day and creeping up on 8 million builds. So this is not just like some little pet project um, that uses LXC sort of as a novelty. This is the bread and butter of CodeShip and by far our, our heaviest used product. And a bit more about the architecture and how it is that we built this. So Basically, we have containers that are sort of universal containers, and you can think of them as empty slots on a big virtual machine. And then you can run a build in an empty slot. And given that these are just slots and they're kind of, uh, they're very flexible and you can swap them out, you can, um, we introduced this idea of pipelines, so parallel CI using build pipelines. So instead of running a build in a slot, which is a container, you can run some task or a group of tasks at the same time. And in theory, you can have N pipelines running kind of in isolation from one another as part of your build. So these are the same service, the same source code, but just splitting up your steps into separate pipelines. And it looks a little bit like this. Um, you have just a couple things uh, running in isolation sort of separately from one another, but at the same time. And then provided those are successful, you can kick off some, some sort of deployment. So this is a very common workflow that our, a lot of our customers use. Um, pretty simple, and you can imagine that LXC was a pretty good fit for accomplishing this model here. But we came across a couple limitations with using LXC alone. And by far, the biggest problem um, is that we were using LXC to run customer builds, but chances are they were not using LXC in d development, and they definitely weren't using it in production. So in the keynote this morning, 
We talked a bit about how LXC previous to Docker was sort of arcane and only for elite technological people. And a lot of our users just simply weren't using LXC. And we were the outlier. And because of that, it was really hard for our customers to debug locally. And it's a problem that we solved by introducing remote debugging sessions, which works just great. Um, and this kind of comes from the fact that with LXC, there's not a great usable interface between the user and the container. So it just wasn't really appealing to our customers to run LXC in development and then in production. And since we designed the system to be sort of like static size slots on a VM, resource consumption at times could be a little bit high or too high for the work that it was doing. Since we didn't allow customers to sort of define the dependencies and the services that they're running in the slots, um, everything sort of got a cookie cutter container allocated to it. So it wasn't the most flexible solution, but it was really easy to use. And in short, when our customers wanted Docker and our customers began adopting Docker, it was clear that with LXC alone, we really weren't able to provide the most efficient product for our customers. And then also, maybe more importantly, for ourselves, because we, of course, use this testing platform when we're developing um, and on our engineering team. So we decided that Docker would be the best choice and a great fit to solve some of the problems that we were having. And just to take us back around to the goal of what it is that we're trying to make is uh, we're trying to build a customizable, flexible testing environment that allows us to run tests in parallel. And Docker helped us do this um, for a couple reasons. Even before 1.0, Docker was like a very, very clear choice that it was something that we should bet on. Docker came with a lot of support and tooling, standardization, and then more importantly, we have a community of really motivated developers. So people were really enthusiastic about using Docker, and we knew that it was something that there would be a need for, and that there was a, you know, a group that was not being served by the tools that were available. Aside from that, for, from us, on, on our perspective, Docker allowed us to build a much better platform than using LXC alone. And I'm gonna go into detail about that platform how it works, how it's different, and then we'll see a demo of it for the rest of the talk. This is called CodeChip Jet, is our Docker platform. And we decided instead of evolving our LXC platform just to start over and build something brand new with Docker in mind, with Docker as a first class citizen. So this is a Docker-based testing platform, truly. We started development in 2014, first beta was in 2015, and then just a couple months ago, in February of 2016, we officially launched Jet or a CodeChip Docker platform to the world. And this is really different and really unique from the previous testing platform using LXC because this is built with Docker in order to support Docker workflows. So with, uh, with this new product, we assume that you're using Docker in development and we assume that you're using Docker in production and therefore can draw the conclusion and make the assumption that you also want Docker during your automated testing and deployment steps. Jet is ramping up and there's certainly a lot of happy customers and, and we use it internally. So we have at peak maybe about 2.3, 2.4 builds per day and then around 250,000 total builds. A couple of the tools that we use from Docker in Jet, so in our CodeChip Docker platform, there's, there's three main ones that I wanna call out. The first one and the most important one is Docker Compose. And Compose is, it, it really was, life-changing, I guess, in the, in the world of a developer who was using Docker before Fig. And then when Fig came on uh, the scene, it just really changed everything because there wasn't an easy way to manage a bunch of services at once. And of course, we borrow the syntax for uh, step definition and service definition because it is so easy and friendly and editable and readable. And we did this on purpose because a lot of our users are using Compose in development, so it made sense just to take that same service definition and then also use it in the test step. We integrate with Docker Registry. We allow users to push and pull from the registry. So you might pull an image down as a service in your tests, and then as a deployment step, push up to the registry. In 1.9 and lower, and I guess in older, we use the registry for remote caching. This changed as of 1.10 content addressable uh, release. I will talk more about that in the engineering challenges section of the talk after the demo. Um, and Docker for Mac and Windows is a really great tool, not only for us, so I, I'm an engineer, and of course I use Docker in development, and I, I love to have VMs like everywhere, and I use Docker on lots of different kinds of machines, but Docker for Mac and Windows is just so easy because I don't have to think about it anymore, 
And also for our users, they're able to download the Jet CLI, which is free. You don't need a CodeChip account to use it and run your tests. But they can just run their builds basically on their own infrastructure, on their own local host, before pushing it up. Um, and it's much easier to debug. This is something that we really didn't have with LXC and just made everyone's lives much easier. The flow of running a build or running automated testing with Jet is pretty similar to other um, non-Docker-based CI, CD systems, um, with a couple really important exceptions. So we get your code from GitHub or from Bitbucket. We, we see that you have committed something. And then we look at the services file and kind of parse that out in a similar way of uh, that Docker Compose would build your services. So we start building your services. Either we pull down an image from the Docker Hub or we use the Docker file to build it for you. And then once all of your services are in place, we can start running testing steps. And each of your testing steps gets its own environment. Um, we'll see this in action in just a little bit. And when your testing steps are finished, everything is green, then we can usually push to a registry as part of a predefined deployment uh, step. So everything is pretty streamlined, really focused on Docker, and we're touching a couple different Docker projects while we're doing it for a really kind of seamless experience for the user. The workflow tools that we get from Docker for that reason are just indispensable. There's no way that we could have built a product that works so well for so many people without Docker. And specifically, there's one thing that Docker allowed us to do that we weren't able to do with LXC, which was to vastly improve our parallel testing workflow. So when we introduced Docker, we were able to add another layer of complexity to our parallel testing workflow because Docker made it so easy to manage services. This was something that we didn't have with LXC. And if you remember back, we had sort of like cookie cutter slots for builds to run in, but there wasn't much customizability when it came to which services would be run with which dependencies at which point in time. So what we did with the Docker platform, and because Docker made it so easy for us, is that we were able to loosen the coupling between the steps that were running, so the build commands, and then also the services that were um, being used along with the step. Um, now you can have n pipelines or n build steps. So maybe you have 10 build steps. And then each of those steps, you can define exactly which service they should run against. Um, for example, you might have integration tests that certainly need your whole stack, like web, database, Redis, et cetera. But if you have a linting step, it doesn't make sense to run all of your linters against a whole stack, because you just don't need all the stuff. You just need the source code. With, um, with Docker and with the new Jet platform, we're able to give the developer control to define that and to specifically say exactly which services and which dependencies are run in conjunction with which build step. Um, the other thing that we introduced was time management and relative time management. So now we have a concept of parallel steps and also serial steps. So along with being able to define services, you can also say at what point in time and what conditions a certain step can be run on. And to, just to give a bit more detail and context about both services and steps, services can be an image from a registry or from a Docker file. And of course, you can specify different Docker files per project. And that's a pretty common workflow to have a test Docker file, maybe a deploy Docker file, development Docker file, et cetera. So all of those things are supported, and you can specify which one you want to build. You can optimize the service for testing tasks, um, maybe by only copying certain directories into the, into the um, image that you need, um, any other customizations, environment variables, et cetera. Everything is in total control of the user, as you would expect with Docker. And then those services are used when you're running build steps. And each build step gets an independent uh, environment that it's executed in. And again, we introduced the idea of serial and parallel steps to give you more control over which, um, like what time in relationship to another time your steps can be run. So if you have a deployment step, that's a good step for a serial step because you don't want it uh, to run in parallel with potentially another failing step. So you have really high control over what's running when with which services. These steps have two functions. Primarily, you have run, which is executing a command against a service. This is make test, for example. Or pushing to a registry, so a deployment step that has uh, you know, executed only when all of your steps have passed. And then you're pushing a, uh, an image to a registry in order to kick off a deployment. The best thing, and my very, very favorite thing about Jet and about this new Docker-based platform is the tag on the step. So you can, um, we do regex matching against a certain tag. So if you have a deployment step, 
You can tag it to only run on branches that match master or something that matches the format of a numerical tag for a release. This is a really powerful way to control maybe pushing to uh, the staging branch and having a, a deploy to stage it happen, staging happen, and then again later having a, um, having a deployment to, uh, to production. So you can do all of this with tagging, and it becomes kind of a defined once and then fits all of your use cases. And if this still sounds maybe not super different from what the previous uh, platform could do, I just want to illustrate the, the difference in time. And if you're not familiar with time series notation or time sequence notation, um, T1 is like time now, and then T2 is time now, and then the next time. So T1, T2, T3 are points in time that are happening sequentially. And we can see all of this is happening at T1. So this is happening at the exact same point in time. This is the old system that was LXC based. We have pipelines, user commands running inside of containers, all at the same time. With Docker and the new parallel testing platform that we built with Docker, we are able to not only control services, the steps, but also time, which is pretty cool. So at T1, we have a step that is running a command against the web service. And then on the very far left-hand side, you can see the web service has two dependencies, Postgres and Redis. So this is all defined by the user. This step is serial. If the step at T1 passes, we move to T2. T2 is two parallel steps, and you can see that the services are different. The services are the light blue boxes. Two steps happening in parallel, but only when those two steps pass can we move to T3. So this is a really powerful way to configure your tests in order to make sure that you're doing exactly what you want at what time you want things to happen. And if this sounds maybe really intimidating, like, oh god, how much code am I going to have to write? Uh, the great news is it's like really not a lot. I'm going to show you uh, the services file right now, and then the steps file, and it's small enough that I can fit it on a keynote slide. So it's really not a lot. This is a CodeShip services file, and if you are familiar with Docker Compose, this probably looks really, really familiar to you. Um, if you're not familiar with Docker Compose, and maybe YAML is new to you, I just want to highlight that the most important points to look at are the high-level um, headings, so DB app and then deployment service. So we have this, uh, in this service configuration, we have a database, which is pulling an image from the Docker Hub. Then we have an app, which is our web service. This is just an um, example of a, I will use a, a small Rails app when I demo this. It could be, could be any web app. And this is linked to the database. And we see that in the links file, or in the links uh, declaration on the very bottom of the app service. And then finally, a deploy service. And we can guess that this deploy service is probably going to be used during a deploy step. I do want to call out that this is Compose version 1 uh, syntax and not version 2. There are a couple, um, kind of a couple things where Jet and Compose aren't in lockstep with each other, simply because we extend Compose and don't use it directly. And we're working on making parity like a, a top priority. Given those services, we have steps. Um, so maybe I lied, and we, I can't fit this whole thing on, on the little narrow keynote slide. But I have some handy notations to make this a little bit easier. Um, this is a group of two serial steps. Step one by the yellow one, and then step two by the yellow two. Within step one is actually where all of my testing goodness is happening. This is a group of parallel steps. So what I'm saying is that I want there to be these four testing steps run in parallel. And if and only if all of those steps pass do I want the second step to happen, which is my deploy. And I'm also using tag in this deploy step. So if this is any branch that's not master, or that doesn't match the regular expression that I've noted in the tag, it, it simply will not, uh, it won't deploy, it won't execute. So this is all of the configuration for being able to run all of my tests in an automatic way, and then push my image up to the Docker Hub. Again, and I cannot stress this enough, it's so fun to think about all the possible configurations that you ever could do with serial and parallel testing groups. Please do not make your deploy step part of a parallel testing group unless you know what you're doing. Um, <laughs> and you probably don't. You think you do, but you don't. Because you don't ever want a deploy step to happen simultaneously with some other testing step that potentially could fail, but the deploy is still successful. So if it's a parallel step, there's no, like, there's no guarantee that if 
the, like that the deploy won't finish before a, a failed step, and then you might end up with broken code in production. So just a pro tip to avoid that. And uh, let's check out what this looks and feels like with uh, a live demo. So I didn't sacrifice to the demo gods, but I did have coffee earlier today, so I, I really hope that counts. All right. We can see everything? Okay, cool. Make this a little bigger. I'm gonna demo a really simple Rails application um, that I made for your enjoyment. This is called NotesApp. Oh, let's see, I'll make this a little bigger um, so that you can see it. This is a really simple application and I'm using um, Docker Compose to run it. It's actually up already. Uh, we can look at the Docker Compose file and see that it's basically identical to what I had in my slide. So I have a web application. Again, this is a simple Rails app running on port 3000. I've mounted a volume in because this is development and I wanna be able to edit my code. And I am using Postgres as my database. So this is running on port 3000. And since I'm using Docker for Mac, I should be able to just say localhost 3000 and see this running. Um, we'll refresh it. And we can see that it's there, great. Um, all this is just like a little task tracking app, so I'll log in with my name. And I can see that I have like, oh, sacrifice to the demo gods and drink some coffee, so I can maybe mark the coffee part. I did that, yeah, I did that. Um, cool, so I did that. Um, I can add a new task, and maybe I notice I wanna change something, so we'll make an update. We'll change the, the text on this button. Seems, seems simple enough. So I'll open up my editor and update it and say like, this is a task app, so maybe like do this thing, please. Um, we'll save that and then I should be able to see that, okay, great. Docker Compose is working as you expect. So that's great. And I maybe had a ticket in Pivotal Tracker and I wanna push this up. And I'm going to see what's going on, oops with git, and I'll add app and commit maybe uh, updating button text. Sounds reasonable. Um, I'm gonna push this to master uh, only for educational purposes, so please don't, don't do this, but it, it's a demo. But before I do it, at least I have some kind of like discretion and self-control, I wanna run my tests locally and I'm gonna use the CodeShip Docker platform Jet, the Jet CLI that you can download to run your tests in, um, on your local machine. It's free, you don't need a CodeShip account or anything. And before we do that, I just wanna take a peek of, at the CodeShip services file. So this is nearly identical to my Docker Compose file that we looked at that I'm using with Docker Compose right now. We have database, an app, and then the second deploy service that I'll use in my deploy step. So these are exactly matching what I had in the slides earlier. We can look quickly at the CodeShip steps file as well. This is the same situation where I have two serial steps. The first one is a parallel step group. And then if that succeeds, then it goes to deploy. Since I'm pushing to master, this is gonna execute immediately, or this deploy step will execute because it matches the, the regular expression in the tag. Um, again, educational purposes. So let's uh, YOLO. Uh, if I can remember how to type while I'm up here. Cool, so I'm pushing this up to GitHub and I have this project set up with CodeShip and I can take a peek and see that my build has been allocated and I can look at everything and see that, hey, it's running. This will take maybe about two minutes. And during that two minutes, while this is running, I wanna explain to you a little bit how the deployment process um, is set up for this application using Docker Cloud. So this is a really easy and flexible and, and pretty like fun and enjoyable way of deploying pretty simple applications. So I have this set up with CodeShip and you see that my testing steps will run in parallel and then I push as my deployment step and I don't do anything else because I have on Docker Cloud this repository and this, uh, this image set up uh, as an auto redeploy application. So every time I push an image up to the Docker Hub, 
the Docker, Docker Cloud sees that it happens and automatically redeploys my application using the new image. And this application is actually up and running now. And if you want to go to dockercondemo.com, which is the coolest domain I've ever purchased in my entire life, um, <laughs> you can check this out. And in about a minute and a half, maybe, we can see the new changes um, that are deployed using CodeShip and then pushing an image. Docker Cloud takes it over from then, and then we have code deployed. This was deployed also with CodeShip and Docker Cloud. Um, we can see we have Eat Some Bacon by my boss, Jim, he loves bacon a lot. Um, Gordon the turtle, get my shell waxed, and uh, a couple other tasks that I didn't finish. We can check on our build, still going. Uh, maybe I wanna see what's happening. I can take a peek at the logs. So every single thing that I'm seeing here is exactly what I saw in my local environment, which is pretty cool. Um, and it makes my life as an engineer, uh, running my tests in containers, between my development and production steps just makes it a whole lot easier. So we can see that some of these parallel tests are finishing up and we're just sort of waiting for RubuCop to finish. Um, and I think actually it is finished because I just saw that deploy step go green, but um, cool. So now dockercondemo.com, if I refresh this, oh. Okay, oh, it's auto redeploying right now. Okay, I caught it at like the exact two seconds. Um, okay, we'll, we'll wait and we'll come back to that right after. Um, but you saw it working before, you know that it works, great. Um, <laughs> I just wanna say again that the, the reason this feels so nice and natural is that I'm using Docker for Mac and Windows. This, from an engineer's perspective, is probably the biggest advantage over using something using, with LXC alone because I can do everything locally before I push it up to um, infrastructure, so to our hosted solution or maybe to your own solution internally. Um, the Jet CLI is free, and you can pull it down to run your tests, and it's available at this bit.ly um, CodeShip Jet Tool link. And this, again, huge advantage over the previous LXC implementation. A bit about uh, some engineering challenges, because I don't want to stand up here and say that adding Docker to your project is going to make everything like super happy and perfect, because it sometimes doesn't. Um, you still have really hard engineering challenges that you need to solve, but the fact is Docker usually makes it easier or um, more straightforward to solve. So one of our infrastructure problems was build allocation time. And when we first built this platform, we didn't have a ton of customers, and also we allow customers to define the specs for their build machines. So it just made sense to make the build machine allocation part of the build itself. Um, this turned out to be not the best choice in the long run now that we had more customers, and sometimes AWS is really slow. So waiting for the AWS machine to boot up was sometimes much, um, much longer than the build itself. So we had some customers that have a, a build that takes 30 seconds, but you have to wait 90 seconds for the build machine. So that's 90 wasted seconds. The great news is that we fixed it, and now we pool build machines. So now allocation time is just about one second. Um, that was uh, not necessarily Docker related, but certainly something when we were building this platform, places that we could optimize. Image caching is also a really, really big issue for us. So as you can imagine, build time is paramount. It is the most important thing to us and to our customers. And as I mentioned before, we used to rely on the registry for caching. So if you pull down an image from the registry, you also got the parent images, um, sort of the parent-child relationship as part of that. This is in Docker 1.9 and, and before. And then if we rebuilt that same image using a Docker file that the, um, that the customer provided, then the cache would be, would be used up until the point it couldn't be. So Docker would sort of decide which layer the cache was in, invalid for and then rebuild everything. Um, this changed with Docker 1.10 because of the content addressable storage update. So this is a, sort of a security focus update that had some interesting impl implications for us using the registry as a remote caching source. Um, the great news is that in Docker 1.11, there is a restoration of the parent-child relationship when image layers are saved out as part of a Docker save command. And I have been working on designing this and now I'm furiously coding along with my team um, to get this up and running and we should have new caching in about one month. Um, this is sort of the double-edged sword of relying on 
external tools. So Docker did a lot for us. But I think in any case, if something is so important, having a third party dependency is like maybe not great all the time. So we are still going to rely on Docker save and load, but a, a, a different way and sort of less attached to the, the core Docker functionality. Aside from those engineering challenges, we have a couple plans for things that are happening next. So Jet was born pre-Swarm, and given the announcements today with Docker 112, we're super, super excited for all of the changes in orchestration and using um, possibly Swarm as a way to manage our machine. So we manage them with a, a service that we sort of rolled our, ourselves. We manage our machines on AWS, and the idea of, of taking that away and maybe moving to a Swarm-based solution is really exciting. Um, there are services like Karina that could make this really uh, easy for us. And if you want to know more about Karina, which is like a Docker Swarm as a service sort of uh, from Rackspace, they have a booth here. Highly recommend that you go check it out. I think it's a super cool project. Um, we also really want to introduce libcompose into this project to make it even easier and to help track Docker Compose a little bit more closely to, to trunk. And this is also one of those situations where we started development before Compose really existed, before Fig was you know, in our hearts and, hearts and minds. So we wrap the APIs directly. And this would be kind of a minimal change for our end users because we are pretty um, supportive. Or we, we track Compose very closely as it is. But for us as engineers, it would just make this so much easier, um, implementing kind of a composed base solution for the service declaration. And we have started preliminary work on this. It doesn't have an ETA that I can announce yet, but uh, it is something that we're hoping. Again, this is not going to be a real big user-facing change, but as an engineer, um, it's something that's going to make my life a whole lot easier. So long story short, TLDR, if there's one thing that you can remember from this talk that highly efficient parallel testing is super cool, and Docker makes it so much easier. Um, before I end, let's see if our friend uh, is working again. It looks like, yes, it's back up. So awesome, yay. Awesome, great, okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs>